my very impromptu prayer, I might add. <laughs> you waited until <laughs> I arrived on screen. <laughs> so, <laughs> so gracious and loving God, we thank you for calling us um, together today as a family, as a, as a community. We uh, thank you in a special way for those uh, giants on whose shoulders uh, we stand for Francis and Claire, Lady Jacoba and Whitey and Donaldo and all of those, uh, Aaron, all of those people who have gone before us and helped to bring us where we are today. We ask you to continue to bless us in our commitment to our Franciscan way of life and sharing the story. We ask you to be in a special way with all of those throughout the world whose lives have been impacted um, by the pandemic. We ask for um, continued development and sharing and spreading of uh, a vaccine. Um, we ask in a special way for the uh, return of the pilgrimages, I think, and, and so that we can um, continue to share our story and our love for Francis and Claire and all of those other men and women who have followed them. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. Uh, this time we, um, uh, we have two presentations. Uh, this time we have Darlene who's gonna talk about Lady Jacoba. And um, next month we'll have uh, Steve Michael will talk about Mary Magdalene. Um, and after that, if anybody wants to give a presentation on something, please just let me know, okay? Good mm -hmm. enough. Okay, uh, Darlene, you ready? Sure, thank you. Uh, it is a great pleasure for me to be here with all of you today. I'm a professor at the Franciscan School of Theology. I know some of you. Um, I haven't met many of you, um, and I don't know what you know about me, but I've been given 20 minutes to talk about one of my favorite Franciscans, and that is Lady Jacoba de Sedizu. Um, and as an aside, I, I will also acknowledge that I will have been given the opportunity to co-facilitate the first pilgrimage with Jean-Francois next year. Uh, it got pushed back from this year, but we are, we're going to be leading a pilgrimage on uh, Franciscan spirituality as a countercultural path. And that's a theme that underlies all of my research, which, is, which focuses on lay Franciscans. So I'd just like to share, start sharing my screen. I entitled this presentation, The Spirituality of Presence and Lessons from the Pandemic, not because I am going to be giving a historical um, in-depth lecture, Lady Jacob, Instead, I'd like us to use the story that we know about Lady Jacoba and just do how we use her, we talk about her in our pilgrimages and how perhaps we, we pray with her, how we reflect with her in our life. I'm getting notification that my internet is unstable. Um, so please let me know if something does not come through, okay? Um, so this is the first question I have. How do we remember Lady Jacoba? And implied in that is um, this question that drives my personal research, that is remembering the role of lay Franciscans, quite literally putting them back into the Franciscan tradition. So some of you, you know this story that when I was asked to write a book about lay Franciscan women, for the Heritage Series for Franciscan Institute uh, publications. I, I wrote the book, I, I made some selections really quite deliberately. I chose not to write about Claire. I chose Angela Foligno, Rosa Viterbo, Margaret of Cortona and Sancho of Naples. Submitted the manuscript and it was when the book came back and I put it in my hands and I opened it up. I looked at the table of contents and I realized, oh my gosh, I forgot Lady Jacoba. I had completely forgotten, it hadn't even occurred to me. It wasn't an editorial decision I made. Uh, 
it was at that moment that I said, I'm going to write a sequel to this book, which I did. And it's uh, called Enduring Presence, and it includes both lay men and lay women in the Franciscan tradition. These are both very small books for the Heritage series, very accessible books uh, uh, outlining the lives and I think some important reflections that we need to make about the role of laity in the Franciscan tradition. So I just bring that forward, Enduring Presence, the first chapter is on Lady Jacoba, and then I think John had sent out a couple other pieces that I've written about Lady Jacoba and Francis. So that can uh, serve as academic or, or content material uh, if you'd like to do some studying around her. But I'd like to ask you, you know, what do you say about Lady Jacoba when you're leading pilgrimages? And we usually start off with almond cookies, right? Um, and in fact, if you remind me when this uh, presentation is over, I will include a recipe for almond cookies in the chat box if you're interested. Um, we love this story about Lady Jacoba baking cookies for Francis. And we know about this story from five accounts of the end of Francis's life in which Jacoba comes to him and included in the things that she brings are the materials to the ingredients to make these almond cookies. It's a tender and sweet story. But is that all we know about her? Is that all we say about her? Do we reduce her role in the Franciscan tradition to that of a cookie baker? And I really don't mean that disparagingly. But is that all we know about her? And is that all we say about her? Another story we often allude to, if not actually tell a full story about, but we often call her Brother Jacoba. We find this appellation uh, quaint and, and kind of cute, even though it appears in only one of the sources, Thomas of Cholano's Treatise on Miracles. Thomas puts into uh, Francis's mouth these words of calling her Brother Jacoba so she can come in to tend to him as he is dying. Bernardo Bessa also refers to her as Brother Jacoba, but in a different sense. But the other sources don't refer to her as Brother Jacoba at all. She is able to retain her gender identity as a noble woman. If we take pilgrims to San Francesco Arripa in Rome, we will walk along via Jacoba de Setesli. So perhaps we will be aware of her role as an important benefactor for Francis and the early friars, but also for subsequent, at least one or two generations of friars. After all, it was because of her, her wealth, her power, her authority in Rome, that she was able to give to Francis and the friars that this first church, which is now called San Francesco Arriba, but also their first house in Rome, so we, write, we might remember to talk about her as an important benefactor. Some of us may remember to, to, rem, to say that once we get up to Assisi, in fact, she was also an important benefactor for the building of the Basilica of San Francesco. This is a point that's made in Andre Vaucher's biography or, or study of, of Francis, but it's often forgotten. Jacoba was a widow by the time she met Francis, most likely, and she decided not to remarry. She retained full custody of her wealth and her power and her authority. And she governed that estate from that sense of authority, and she funneled her wealth towards the Franciscans and probably other worthy causes. She would have funneled her resources into the building of this church. But do we remember to say that when we bring pilgrims to the church? Now, this story, I'm, I'm not quite sure what to do with, but I, I hear this story often. And in fact, I, I even repeat it. We probably all recognize the Simone Martini fresco from the lower basilica. And 
uh, it's, it's sometimes called Claire. We, if you do a Google search of Claire of Assisi, you'll see this painting included. Art historians have speculated it could be Margaret of Cortona. There's a lot of speculation about who it is. Some people say it's Jacoba, Lady Jacoba. And they point especially to the fact that around this, her halo are seven sons. Jacoba de sete soli, sete soli, seven sons. Seven sons around her head in this halo. I'll be honest, I really like this story and I like this argument. I'm not sure how accurate it is. Uh, Martini used these rondelles in many paintings, but um, perhaps we can have some conversation around this story. It would make sense, wouldn't it, for a painter in the 14th century to acknowledge the important action of Jacoba. Most likely, we point out Jacoba's first resting place in the lower basilica underneath this modern painting of her. This depicts her coming to Assisi with all of the elements that she's need to care for the dying Francis. And then we come down to the crypt. We all know that as we descend those stairs, when we get to the bottom, our inclination is to look immediately to the right, immediately to the chapel where Francis and the companions are interred. But if we turn to the left, there is this niche, this niche in the wall with this small casket and this very small placard that notes that this is the resting place now of Jacoba de Sotesili, a noble woman who was most devoted to Francis and who died in 1239. Now, now, most of us actually do probably mention this. If not the first time we take pilgrims into the crypt, at least perhaps we bring pilgrims back and show them this spot. But why I want to make an extra effort to emphasize the importance is uh, comes from a story that I have from teaching history of Christianity. And one day I was just teaching the early tradition of the Franciscans. I included Francis Clare, the early companions, and I included a story of Jacopa. I always talk about Jacopa as a caregiver at the end of life for Francis. And in the front row of my class, there was a student, a mature student, a retired physician who fell into tears as I lectured. Now, I, I know I wasn't offering an emotionally charged lecture that day. And so I was a little dumbfounded when she didn't leave right after class, but kept weeping. I sat next to her and asked her, What's coming up for you? Where are you with this, with this story of Lady Jacoba? And she recounted that she had set up a pilgrimage for her family. They had gone on this pilgrimage to Rome and Assisi just weeks prior to the class starting. <clears throat> and she had hired a pilgrimage guides, none of none from this group. So I, this isn't. Uh, any comment on the pilgrimage guides here. But they had taken her through Assisi, taken her to many lovely sites and beautiful sites, and they had had a deep spiritual experience and prayerful experience. But not one person had mentioned even the figure of Lady Jacoba. She had never heard of Lady Jacoba. And she mentioned how many times she had been in the crypt and would have walked past the remains of Lady Jacoba without knowing it. Why it was so painful for her was that she said, now, only now, I know my place in this tradition. Now I see it. It's through Lady Jacoba, through her caregiving, through her presence with Francis at the end of life. Now I understand my place. It's a powerful story that 
I reflect on now often because I have a similar experience with this figure of Lady Jacoba after having forgotten her years ago, but then moving into volunteer hospice caregiving, I get it. I now see her role and function in the tradition. She has lots of functions, lots of roles. But I wonder if now in this time of pandemic, if we can bring forward this most important presence of her being a caregiver to Francis as he was dying. Why do I say this now during the pandemic? Well, we, we read many newspaper accounts of people dying alone. And these articles are heartbreaking and the stories that people uh, relate are heartbreaking. They point to great suffering, both of family members and the dying. We have come to appreciate perhaps in this absence, just how important presence with the dying is. Now, now maybe we all assume, oh, we always knew that, we always knew that. But I can tell you as a hospice caregiver that many people flee from the bedside of the dying. Even spouses have sometimes a hard time being present at the dying. But is it possible for us to use this story of tender presence to work with this, this challenging life event that all of us will, will live and die into, and that is the end of life? We know from the accounts that Jacoba brought with her those things that would be needed to bring comfort to Francis. A pillow, a cloth, a tunic, a fresh tunic. So we, we have this list of things, but what did it really look like? What would it have been like? We have to use our imagination. We have to actually use our lived experience with this to flesh out what this experience was like. I, I, I like this image done by Howard Schroeder because of the eye contact between Jacoba and Francis. You know, I'll be honest, Francis looks really healthy there at, for being at end of life. Um, so we have to work with it. Uh, but there are all these elements around, including those almond cakes. And how tenderly she's holding his hand. Being present, especially through that gaze. Another painting I find especially evocative is by the Chilean painter from the early 20th century. And here we have Jacoba really reaching out, caring for Francis. We can see the stigmata on his feet. We can see the pillow under his head, the jug of water that would have been used to bathe him. We know from other sources that this is the role that women had in the Middle Ages. They bathed the dying. They cared for the dying. And they cared for the loved ones who surrounded the bedside. So we can imagine that Jacoba not only comforted Francis, holding his hand, perhaps putting a cool compress on his head, saying prayers, singing prayers, being present but also being present with the friars, listening to their stories as they recounted their interactions with Francis, comforting them in their pain and in their grief. In the end, is there more to the story of Jacoba and Francis than cookies or calling her brother Jacoba. 
How is it that we can remember her, bring her fully into this tradition that we call Franciscan? Yes, she was a great woman of faith. We know that. We could even expand on this in, a, in another talk at some point. This relationship she did cultivate with Francis, it would have been one of mutual sharing. She was a great benefactor, yes. She offered much material wealth to Francis and the friars and the subsequent uh, generations of friars. She was a great friend to Francis. She was a host. She offered hospitality. And at least for me, most importantly, she was a caregiver at the end of his life. She was present and with great compassion eased any suffering he experienced. So this is, is my very brief presentation. If, if you have questions, I'm happy to entertain them. And please note my email if you'd like to be in touch with me. Um, we, I'd be happy to talk through email about this. That's my very quick overview. <laughs> Thank you. Now. Darlene, I have a couple of questions. Um, I'm one of those people having been in the nursing profession myself that's been so connected with Jacoba my whole life too. And um, in the course of pilgrimages, we never miss a chance to point out where she lived in the Circus Maximus. And, Amazingly, over the years, they've been doing some um, discoveries, you know, uh, trying to, I guess, reveal what that home, the Septicillium, might have looked like. So my first question is, have you come across any uh, materials that kind of indicate what that home in Rome looked like? It was certainly located in a place of wealth, and it's certainly on the fringe of all of that. That's my first question. And then when we get down to San Damiano, I always mention her in relationship to Claire because here she is in Assisi, Jacoba's in Assisi after the death of Francis. Claire has also been a caregiver for Francis down at San Damiano. And so I love to speculate that these two women talk to each other, you know, yeah. trying to get at that conversation because she lives she lives in in Assisi for a while and she does not join Claire she takes on this role of a, a dedicated lay person a secular Franciscan I like to refer to her as yeah. but I always wonder and imagine what the conversation of those two women might have been I have to believe it happened but I don't know if you came across any kind of indication or talked yeah. about and there's no documentation of any conversation between no. them and this is where um i probably stray from my uh strictly academic historian colleagues who have to <laughs> and i that's how i'm trained to to mm -hmm. stick to the documentation and yet these um i'm open to speculation as long as we're very clear about that mm -hmm. so they're the only thing that i uh can give you in terms of this connection between uh, Jacoba and Claire is a mosaic in Washington, DC. You might know about it in St. Matthew the Apostle Church. There's a mosaic of, of Claire and Jacoba. Really? So, yeah, there is. And so oh. I could send that to John if, if you- Oh, that would be great. I, did, I took it out of my PowerPoint presentation. Um, and to answer your first question, I. I'm aware of that there is archaeological work being done in the Circus Maximus. And I've, uh, the last time I was in Rome, I, I walked around the Circus Maximus and, and prayed uh, with the figure of Jacoba, but I don't know the academic work on that. Okay, okay. But it's certainly something to look into. Mm -hmm. As an aside, I just tried to put in uh, the cookie recipe that I have for almond cookies. Great. Because um, it's really good. It's really good. Um, but I think it's too long. There must be a word limit on the chat. Oh. So, so again, what I can do, I'm just going to write myself a little note that 
if John would be willing to send out afterwards um, the mosaic. Okay. And the cookie recipe, if you're interested, you know. Yeah. Um, I did a lot of research on cookie recipes. Yeah. Before yeah. I included this one in the Enduring Presence. Mm -hmm. uh, Darlene, do you have the picture of Jacoba from the Jesu in the Sacred Heart Chapel? I think it's the Sacred Heart Chapel. There is an incredible image of her at the foot of Francis. I have that photo. I'd be happy to send that to you if you do not have that. That would be super. Yeah. Yeah. That would be great. Thank you. And then there's the one on the side of the, the chapel where Francis died in the Porziuncola. That's I love that image too. She's in that beautiful red dress. But if you don't have the Jesu one, I'll be happy to send that to you. That would be great. Thank you. Darlene, um, in, the, in, in the in the um, line of what you call speculation, and Joanne used the same word, uh -huh. um, and not to maybe overplay it, but the idea of calling her brother, uh, in my branch of the order, and I can't speak for the Capuchins and the Conventuals, you may be aware that we receive women uh, who have a special connection to the province into the order. They're fully invested with a habit, our habit, and uh, they and ultimately end up in our necrology and they could, end, they could come to anything they want. We have several women in our necrology uh, mm -hmm. of, my, of my province. Uh, and we just uh, got permission. We have to get the permission through Rome after it's approved at the provincial level. Uh, and I think of that um, in relationship to the Porziuncola, where she came to visit, uh, would have been a place of, of, of solitude. And from his writing on solitude, he always hedged off the solitude place. Okay, uh, and that hedging off might have been a deterrent from, for her from those uh, who were, would have been, quote, guarding this, this type of um, uh, an experience there might have been uh, difficult for her to get in. And Francis, and Francis I don't know, somebody else is talking. And Francis, um, you know, I, I almost think take it in, in a humorous way, makes her a brother. Yeah. But we, we receive these women. Uh, there's one who works right in our house and she's just been approved here um, uh, within the last two months, but we can't receive her because right now we do a ceremony of reception. We can't do it right now because of COVID, but we two who live in the house, we've always referred to her as the third friar. So I just wanna say to you that uh, you may be aware of it from your work in the Santa Barbara province out there, um, but that for me has always been precious and special. Oh, thank you. Uh, one of the things I would just like to share as I continue to talk to our various healthcare systems, their need for the pilgrimage is going to be quite different than what we experienced before. They are dealing with so much death. They mm -hmm. are so exhausted of caregiving. What we will be sharing with them on pilgrimage may have to be somewhat different because of their needs. And, you know, the, the wonderful example of Claire and Jacoba as caregivers may become a very significant uh, point of opening up discussion. But the, the well planned out pilgrimages that we have given through healthcare systems, there may need to be a rethink based on what we're hearing from them as to what do their people need. There is so much healing and they are physically, mentally, spiritually exhausted. So the more we can uh, bring that Franciscan spirituality to help in the healing, uh, we will be listening attentively to what they are saying, but the need is great.